Is, is that an option? Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the session. Uh, I hope at the end of the session you walk away with something useful for your, I mean, particular projects, work, or whatever hobbies that you're practicing, okay? Um, this is a presentation of running Linux on Azure. Um, and uh, this is, uh, my name is Enrique Sanchez. I'm a senior escalation engineer with the Azure Linux support team. Um, I've been at Microsoft for three and a half years, and uh, I've been working with AIX, I mean, with Unix, Linux, since uh, AIX uh, 3. Point, uh, for longer than I care to admit, and um, I mean, with all kind of versions of Linux and uh, BSD. Um, my first distribution was Slackware, and as a hobby, well, as uh, part of help to the community, uh, we foster kittens uh, from the Guilford County, uh, animal shelter uh, to try to to get them ready for before they can be adopted. Okay. Um, I have a multiple personality disorder uh, on social media. I have all kinds of ideas. Uh, if you can find me on IRC, my my nickname of uh, battle is ESV. Uh, I use a couple of ones or others. Uh, uh, in GitHub, my user ID is e Sanchez Bella, uh, and e ESV Microsoft is the one that you use for uh, work, uh, personal stuff. Uh, again, I, I, I make a mess of everything. Right on Mastodon, uh, I'm one of one of my social accounts is that there. Uh, but if you go and look at it, uh, that is mostly a picture of kittens playing or or doing funny stuff. All right, so nothing technical. Uh, now the presentation I'm going to give is based on my personal opinions, experience, and uh, not the views of my employer organizations or any anyone else. So whatever I, I say is take it take it on on me. Oops. Uh, also, if I use any third-party logos, I don't I don't claim ownership or support or endorsement of those. Uh, this is a personal presentation. Um, whenever the documentation and whatever I, I say here uh, it are in conflict, the official uh, documentation prevails. Please let me know so I can submit a change in the documentation. Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Linux on Azure, what can you run on Azure? I mean, pretty much you can run anything, right? You can run uh, Alma Linux, Debian, Kali Linux, OpenSUSE, Slackware, Red Hat, FreeBSD, Rocky Linux, Oracle, Ubuntu, and of course, it couldn't, it couldn't be missed, uh, Microsoft Azure Linux, yes. We have our own distribution. Um, right now is not designed to be consumed by general workloads. For example, if you want to deploy a LAMP stack, it is not designed for that. It's mostly designed for internal consumption and, and services around Azure, Mic um, Azure Microsoft, right? Uh, or platform as a service services. Uh, what, uh, or of course, if you bring your own, I mean, you have a, uh, and Linux running on Azure on, on your on-prem, and you want to migrate to uh, Azure, uh, is possible. All you need to do is slap a 
uh, hybrid drivers and you're good to go, right? Um, what kind of architectures? I mean, you can find Intel, I mean, uh, Intel architecture, AMD, and ARM64 processors. Um, there are two generations of machines. Uh, the generation one that uses BIOS boot and generation two that uses UEFI. I mean, there is there is a good mix of both. Customers still deploy both, and there is no shame in that. I mean, all, most, most of the distributions are released on both architectures. Migrating from one architecture to the other is not possible or is not supported yet. I, I, I've heard rumors that is going to be supported, but nothing official. Option, optional boot options for generation two. You have the secure boot options. You have trusted launch and also confidential workloads. The secure, the secure and, and trusted boot are available for almost any distribution that is available on generation two. The confidential workloads are specially tailored images that are not available in every single region, not every single distribution, and, and not every single architecture. Uh, Linux is not a minor player in Azure. We, we have more, of the, more than 60% of the cores are running Linux, and more than 60% of the servers, the commercial servers, are Linux servers. Now, if you go to machines overall, Windows still, still takes the cake because they have the, what they call the virtual desktops, and they are mostly, or they are all Windows machines. Um, my job, or, or my, the running Linux on Azure, I mean, like you, you will run it in the in, uh, infrastructure as a service model, where uh, uh, Microsoft Azure is responsible of the physical infrastructure, physical networking, and physical host, and what runs inside the machine, how it runs, the users, how you, whether you integrate that with Active Directory or with Azure, with Entra ID, is up to the customer. And my job, as, I, as, as you, you will find, that circle, uh, that's, I mean, that area gets a little bit murky. Uh, we, we help customers when they have problems with their Linux workloads. Uh, we may, uh, at some point, we may direct the customer, say like, I mean, like, this is beyond our control, or, or for example, we are not going to make architectural de de decisions, but I mean, we, we may help customers. Also, we have commercial distributions the, with the pay-as-you-go model, where you, in, uh, you pay Microsoft for the cost of the infrastructure, plus an additional line, an additional line ad item for the licensing cost. Um, those are uh, Red Hat, SUSE Linux, Ubuntu Pro. Um, and we have what's called the Azure Hybrid Benefit. Let's say that you start in one model, the pay-as-you-go, and you want to switch back to, uh, I mean, like you want to switch out of it, that you're not getting the benefits, or, or you can uh, broker a deal better with the vendor. You can switch to bring your own license and be done with that. Uh, that model is available for, uh, so, uh, for SUS Enterprise Linux and for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's available for marketplace images and on-prem images. Uh, I am going to go through these. I mean, then I'm going to go to the details of the Linux uh, workloads, right? Uh, also, the Azure Hybrid benefits for Ubuntu. You can deploy a free Ubuntu machine, and then you can migrate to Ubuntu Pro if you want. But that migration is one way only, and the only way to get out of it is destroy the machine. Mm. You can link your Red Hat accounts if you're running a pay-as-you-go model. You go to the, on the left-hand side panel, you go to the bottom here and, and select the Red Hat customer portal. You will see a window like this. You select that link and then uh, with you, you are going to be redirected to Red Hat portal and 
uh, your accounts will be linked. With that, you will have access to the I mean, to the documentation that Red Hat has behind their paywall. Mm. Okay, now, what are, why are we here? Running Linux in Azure, best and not so best practices. <laughs> this management. With the disk management, there are, uh, for example, multi-volume OS disk. Running a multi-volume OS disk on-prem, let's say VMware or a physical server, is perfectly valid. You can do that in Azure. They will run just fine. However, the, the Azure native tools will not support them. For example, Azure Disk Encryption, Azure Backup and Recovery, Azure Site Recovery tools. They do not support multi-volume OS disk. It also breaks the, the Azure troubleshooting tools and most of the trainings that the engineers are getting on how to help customers solve their problems. So, I mean, the, the workaround to that is that you can increase the OS, OS disk on the fly. Many distributions, uh, I mean, like, for example, if you're running a, a raw partition disk, you can grow the partitions manually. Right, you will have to take the machine down, you increase the disk, and then you boot. Uh, and then you, you, I mean, like, there are plenty of documentation on how to increase the disk once the machine is boot. If you're running LVM, again, it's possible to increase the OS disk. Disk mirroring or RAID infrastructure, right? First of all, you will have to use a multi-volume OS disk, or even for data disk, right? But why would you do that? The, the storage is a software-defined storage, right? That if you lose access to one disk, you will lose access to all of them. Also, let's say that you're running on a virtual host and that virtual host lose, loses access to the whole infrastructure in Azure. I mean, all the disks are coming through the uh, physical host at all, right? So you lose access to all the disks. Um, place critical data or production data on the ephemeral devices. The Azure SKUs are, are provisioning with this ephemeral device that is designed very fast and doesn't count against the I.O. limits of the SKU, right? But don't place uh, critical data or production data because that disk, I mean, when your machine gets evicted from the physical host, that particular disk stays with the host and it's impossible to recover, right? And I have been on multiple cases where the customers, they, they, they actually lose data on it. Um, mount file systems on top of the ephemeral disk. Uh, and as you can, uh, can, can you see that? Or is it too small? Uh, well, uh, the, the ephemeral disk is mounted on the slash MNT by default. I, I, I personally think that is a, a poor choice, but I mean, like, well, I mean, it's, it, it is what it is, and uh, it, uh, it has been done forever, right? And it always comes last when you, uh, when you stop the machine, it will be always, uh, and the machine comes up, it will always come last. So if you have, uh, uh, data file systems that mount on the slash MNT, it is, it is going to be a convoluted process. And probably you will need to reboot the machine two or three times to get it on the network. Uh, what you can do is, I mean, you can either provision a machine without a ephemeral disk, or you can move your data file systems away from slash MNT, which not always is possible, or using cloud in it, you can mount it. Uh, uh, you you can mount it on, on a different location, right? There is enough public documentation uh, on how to how to do that, uh, uh, accomplish that goal. Um, network. When it comes to network management. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where customers do static IP on their machines. They move the machine and then the machine doesn't work anymore because they move the, the network, they do other kind of setups and the machine doesn't work anymore, right? 
or the NIC, the network interface card changes and it's, 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 a, it's a mess, right? Use DHCP, leverage DHCP, and don't use uh, UDEV rules to hard code the MAC address of the adapter. Because if you want to move the machine from one network to another, uh, you're, you, you need to provision a new NIC, right? If you use static resolution, I mean, like if you go and edit result.conf, result.conf is modified by network manager, with result D, all those new demons that uh, are coming to manage the network and the name resolution. Uh, what you need to do is work with the DHCP options. Fortunately, Linux gives us a lot of options and a lot of methods on how to accomplish the same goal. So I cannot tell you, oh, just, just go and edit this file because it will be different for every single distribution, right? Um, here, I'm, 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 I'm showing the, the menu to do the network card management and, and how you do that, uh, I mean, what, what it shows, it shows, for example, how to add or how to remove a particular network adapter from the machine, whether you can assign a public IP address or not, and then in the bottom, you see the, the private IP of the, of the adapter. You can, you can set that on stone, or you can say Azure just sign uh, whatever whatever is available on you. Uh, customers uh, they choose different options depending on their needs, but everything is defi defined here. And then the, the, when the machine boots, it, it will pick up those details from the uh, from the infrastructure itself, from from Azure itself. If the IP address is not defined in Azure, nobody will be able to reach to your machine, okay? Uh, also, if you want to define your own on-prem or different domain servers other than the Azure, the, the, wire, the Azure wire server functions as a regular name server, but obviously it will only resolve public domain names. If you want it to resolve private domain names, you have to use your own domain names. And on the network interface card, you can define your own DNS servers. Uh, you can do that at the network interface card or at the VNet level, okay? Um, now, placing multiple network interfaces in the same, uh, in the same subnet. It is a TCP IP nightmare. Uh, and you are not going to gain any reliability on, on, the, on the host, right? Because again, it's a software defined network. And if you lose access to one, I mean, to one NIC, both NICs are going to go. And I mean, there is no, I mean, it, we're not in the physical world where you can, you can fail over from one to, to the other. And if you want to do bundling, it doesn't work either because the Azure network is an Azure, I mean, it's a software-defined network where layer two doesn't exist, right? So again, it's possible. Uh, it is a convoluted process. I mean, there are, I mean, there are instructions in the public documentation, every different operating system. Um, has their own way. For example, Red Hat has one way, SUSE, SUSE Enterprise Linux has a different way, and Ubuntu, obviously, they had to do a different way, right? So they all went uh, sideways in, on that. Mm. Mm. If you want to, to work, I mean, like, for example, you want uh, more uh, throughput or bandwidth, what you need to do is use network acceleration. Right, uh, you can you can define uh, a number of network adapters per per machine with network ac acceleration enabled. And uh, I mean, the caveat is that the machine has to be down in order to enable or disable that, and that is done at the adapter level. Um, 
let's let's do a little bit of uh, system management, right? As I, I was mentioned before, don't use the ephemeral disk for data. Have reliable backups and plan for disaster recovery. Yes, we're in the cloud, but as Larry Ellison said that long time ago, you are just running on someone else's computer. Uh, disasters happen. Uh, users make mistakes, or, or maybe system administrators make mistakes, uh, and, and recovering from backups or backup recovery are required. Also, I mean, if you're subject to compliance rules, I mean, like you, you need to keep your, your backups in check, right? Um, do that, especially during migrations. If you're going to do a migration, you can take a snapshot of your OS disk and you can recover in minute if anything goes south, right? I mean, like instead of, 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 of engaging the backup and recovery team, waiting for the full, full restore to happen, you take a snapshot, a snapshot takes a couple of minutes to create, and then uh, you, you, you do your migration, and if anything goes wrong or you need to fall back, you have your full snapshot and you can recover in, in minutes. You create a new disk, you swap the drive, and, and, and that's it. I mean, like probably half an hour of downtime and you're good to go. You're back to before your, I mean, at the moment of your snapshot. Uh, we do this all the time. Uh, for example, whenever a customer calls with a problem and says uh, it, it requires a modification with the OS, I mean, OS, first we do is take a snapshot so we can go, go back to that particular snapshot. Okay. The, uh, again, the, the snapshots just speed up recovery. I think I'm going too fast. <laughs> uh, and system management, uh, the, the default Python interpreter. It just happens in the, com in the com uh, commercial distributions or, or distributions like Red Hat that they, are, they, they preserve the, sta the stability. So the Python interpreter tends to lag behind the upstream. And sometimes, I mean, most of the time, applications, they say like, okay, yeah, I'm fine running on Red Hat Eight, but you need to put uh, Python 3.12. And what customers come and do, they replace the Python interpreter, but at the moment that you remove Python from the server, or you, uh, you point the default Python to a different location, the internal tools that leverage that Python, they are using modules that not necessarily translate to the new interpreter and all, th all sort of things happen. Also, when you remove the interpreter, the, whatever tools that depend on it will be removed. And if you don't keep track of those particular dependencies, you are going to lose uh, functionality in Azure. Cloud in it is a very strong dependent, has a very, I mean, like, it depends, it lives off Python, right? So, uh, and, that's a lot of fun to recover a machine. <laughs> you can use, um, here, uh, you can use uh, Python virtual environments or, uh, to, to make sure that your application points to the right location and, and, uh, and has a successful operation, okay? Spend the time burn, I mean, burning your application into Azure because if you want to mold Azure into your application, that is not going to be a fun time. Again, the Linux agent has strong dependencies on it. Cloud in it and other dependencies will be removed. I mean, oh, uh, Cloud in it and other dependencies for Azure itself are going to be removed and they are not going to be reinstalled when you reinstall Python. Um, uh, the, the Linux agent, is it, it used to be the provisioning agent. It, it used to be the way that machines were provisioned uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, but as technology progresses and as we uh, try to make use of off-the-shelf and upstream tools, we will leverage whatever, I mean, is available to, to the VMs, right? Um, 
a lot of people tend to, I mean, they, they want special functionality in the upstream projects, especially with cloud in it, that they try to replace cloud in it that comes with the standard distribution. It brings a lot of um, issues because uh, the, the upstream versions are not backwards compatible with each other. So please leave cloud in it alone and, and, and use the, the one from the preferred I mean the preferred distribution uh, the, that, that comes with the distribution itself. Especially if you come from on-prem and you're going to install cloud in it, make sure that it comes from the distribution uh, vendor. Um, when, when customers do hardening of the, when customers do, do hardening of the machines, uh, they tend to disable, I mean, like, for example, there is a, a famous uh, CI, CIS conversion script that applies all the rules from CIS. And that tends to remove the UDF driver. The UDF driver is, is required when the machine is being provisioned. Right? Especially if you want to pass secure data, data through cloud in it. Uh, I mean, like, let's say information like passwords or other confidential secrets that is passed through the UDF driver. Uh, and if you disable the UDF driver, that metadata is not going to be present in the machine. And, and again, that information is not going to be available for your uh, server. Mm. Systems recovery. Uh, I know that, I mean, like everybody here, I mean, like they are pretty smart Linux users, admins, uh, professionals, and uh, I am not going to teach anyone how to do systems recovery. I am going to just, just work with the Azureism, right? Uh, let's say that your machine, nobody can log on, uh, nobody can, can log into the machine, but uh, the machine is up on the network, let's say that someone messes up with the sudo configuration file, right? And no, nobody can become root. Uh, you, through, the, through the run command extension, I mean like, for example, here, what I'm showing is the, the portal, but you can do that through the API or, or, or through PowerShell or the Azure CLI. You can execute, leverage the run command extension to run a command like root, for example, here, the, the one command that I'm using is the who, who am I and, and, and the password, P, uh, PWD command, which is the, well, we know, right? Uh, systems recovery. Now, we, we have what is called the pets versus cattle option, right? Treat your machines like, uh, I mean, like the, the pets are our furry companions, like, for example, my cat that is in the background. And, and we treat them, and we refer them as family. The, car, the cattle are not so lucky, right? So if you can have a generic image, if you can create an, a generic OS image that you burn your application constraints and all that inside the, the OS disk, and then you can replace those disks on the fly, that, that, will, uh, that will save you a lot of time and headaches. Um, when an image fails, just replace the drive, I mean, create a new, a, 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 a new OS disk and replace it and, and go with that. Um, now, that is, uh, it, it's easier said than done, right? I mean, like, it's not, not so easy, but it is, it is possible. Um, we, can, we can access the serial console uh, just make sure that your uh, your grub is is built with this particular with the con uh, this particular three op I mean options in the in the grub configuration file and remove the quiet and splash. I mean those are, are I mean the quiet will be suppressing the, the log messaging and the splash is only used for uh, uh, graphic consoles. Um, Additionally, you will require uh, a storage account, either a managed storage account or a dedicated one. I mean, the, the portal will, will tell you uh, how to go, right? 
but if you can get to the console, you can, you can do pretty much whatever you want. I mean, the only problem with the console, <laughs> the, the only problem with the serial console is a, sub, is a software construct, and it times, uh, I mean, like, it, it takes some time to uh, connect to the machine, and, and sometimes the timeout that we have in the grub is, is smaller than that particular timeout, and it's, uh, uh, sometimes it's not possible to catch the machine and do the uh, and, and and work with the grub options to boot into single user mode, right? Um, the serial console is not available if the machine is not is deallocated, right? And there, uh, as I mentioned, there is the, the the delays in connectivity or the grub may be locked. I, I've been on several several cases where. I mean, the customer has a very secure environment that not even the admins, not the, the grub password. Um, what you can do in that situation is clone the OS disk, right? Uh, assign it as a data disk to a recovery VM, execute the repairs that you need to do, I mean, for example, if you need to change the password of a user, either you can edit the, the Etsy shadow file or whatever, or you can run in a uh, short root environment, right? And then all you need to do is swap the OS disk. The only caveat is that this particular clone has to match one by one the availability zone and the region of your problematic disk. Also, the, 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 the recovery machine has to be the same generation as your uh, problematic machine. They don't have to be the same distribution. For example, you can recover a Red Hat machine using an Ubuntu one, or SLES, or vice versa. I mean, all, all you need to do is your recovery machine be able to recognize the file systems of your problematic machine. For example, if you deploy an Ubuntu 18 machine, it will not be able to read the XFS file systems on Red Hat 9, okay? Red Hat 8, it can handle Red Hat 9. 1804, I mean, 1804 is end of life, right? But still, a lot of people say like, yeah, but I mean, just deploy an Ubuntu 1804 and, and be done with that. 1804 cannot read the XFS of Red Hat 9. And, and if you deploy that, you are going to see a, a whole bunch of nothing, right? Uh, also, another caveat is that you have to keep track of your snapshots, your disk names, where, where your I mean, original disk and all that stuff. It's a lot of fun. I've been on cases where the customer loses track of the recovery disk that they just fix. And, and I mean, like, you're going to say, like, hey, for seriously? Yes, uh, seriously. Uh, so what we can use is use the, uh, the AC CLI to recover the machine. The AC VM repair, uh, it, 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 it automates the cloning of the OS disk creates a, a machine of the required generation on the required availability zone, on the required zone, uh, a region, I'm sorry, and will attach the, the problematic disk as a data disk to the recovery VM. And then with the ACVM repair, restore, it will reverse the process and it will swap the disk for you. Uh, there are predefined recovery scripts that c fix uh, common situations, right? For example, if you have uh, a, an invalid FSTAB, right? Uh, let's say that the invalid FSTAB is, is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, there is a, a particular script that will uh, help you doing that particular recovery. Uh, you can use the portal. I mean, like nobody forces you to use the, the, the CLI, PowerShell, or anything else to do your own recovery, right? But these are tools that are very helpful with the, um, 
uh, recovery of the environment. Uh, here I'm going to, uh, I have a couple of links, uh, the how to, uh, for example, I talk about the Linux diagnostics uh, that we can capture from, uh, from your VM prior agreement of, of the customer. I mean, whenever you report a problem with the Azure portal and you decide whether you want to share uh, troubleshooting information with us or not, if you decide that you want to share information, uh, that is uh, information that can be shared uh, with us. Um, how to link your access, your Red Hat account to the to the Microsoft subscription, and how to I mean like one is an easy uh, a common link to to search is how to increase the size of the of the disk. I, I can put that in my GitHub account, or I don't know whether, I mean, like, there's a common repository for... Okay. So, again, uh, my, my GitHub account will be uh, E. Sanchez Bella, right? Uh, if, and with that, uh, I, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether there are questions in the audience. No questions? Well, uh, it's too, too basic. <laughs> well, well, I mean, if you, you don't have any questions, we have uh, like what, 10 minutes or 15 minutes back to the cost. Okay. Well, thank you very much.